when Saul was trying to kill David. David had a chance to sneak up on Saul and kill him. But instead, David used this opportunity to show everyone who really is in charge and only took just a small piece of Saul's garment because David trusted in God. Well, we are continuing with our message series on uh, the series that I like to call After God's Own Heart. It's the story of King David, and we've been taking a look at uh, all the really interesting, cool things about the life of David and how he was truly a man after God's own heart. And I hope that uh, each one of us will be able to really wrap our minds around what it means to be after God's own heart. Today we're going to be talking about a godly response to evil. And frankly, that shows a great deal about what that means to be after God's own heart. I hope you see the common thread that goes through this whole message series is seeking a godly heart. I hope that we would be seeking a godly heart in others, but I also hope that we would learn to start seeking a godly heart even in ourselves to change the way we think and feel and act so that we can truly be people after God's own heart as well. So far in the story, we saw how uh, when uh, the prophet Samuel came to Jesse's sons, he saw that Jesse's sons were, were strong and, and handsome. And God said, no, you don't look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And he saw the heart of a little shepherd boy and said, this will be the next king. And we need to learn to look at uh, the heart as well, not just on outward appearances. Last week, we saw how God is bigger than your giants. And we saw how David took on Goliath, this enormous six foot or nine, nine foot nine inch uh, huge giant. And he did not kill Goliath in his own strength, but in God's. We also learned that we all have giants in our lives. They may not be uh, nine-foot warriors, but they could be the things that we struggle with. And we know that God can conquer those giants as well. Today we're going to be talking about acting out of a godly heart. So that we need to know that if we're going to have hearts that are after God's, we need to understand that our actions need to be that of people who are seeking God as well. Okay, well, let's take a look at this uh, very difficult situation that David found himself in. And the real question here is responding to an unfair attack. How do you respond when someone is attacking you? Well, this story picks up when uh, last we found David. He just got done slaying the giant Goliath. He cut off his head and paraded it into Jerusalem. And everyone cheered and cheered for David. And David and Saul had become very close. He was a welcome member of the king's court. He would be playing his lyre for the king, which is kind of like a guitar or a harp or something like that. And uh, uh, he became a very welcome person to the king. But... After, being, after many years of them being on the road, fighting battles with one another and, and defeating their enemies, uh, once they came into Jerusalem and the people were shouting out to the king, Saul, Saul has killed his thousands. And now in my mind, I'm thinking a parade. So they're like on a horse or, or maybe on a float towed by a wagon. Okay, that's probably not, or they're probably not the same way. But um, uh, Saul comes into town, and people are cheering. Saul has killed his thousands, and the king's waving. Yes, yes, thank you very much. But then David comes up behind him, and they start saying, "But David has killed his tens of thousands." Yeah, David. Okay, I don't know if they're actually wooting, but uh, can you can you almost picture what that would be like? And can you imagine all the passion? And energy. David, he's our man. Yeah, let's go get him. Yeah, David. Yeah, this didn't sit too well with the king. Can you imagine what might have been going through the head of the king? Saying, hey, wait a second, I'm the king. Why are they cheering David for Pete's sakes? 
And unfortunately, when you start having those kinds of feelings, you might be thinking, oh, wait a second, everybody loves David. What more does he want? I bet he wants the throne itself. Well, of course, he knew that he was going to be the next king. He was anointed by, by Samuel. But the worst thing about it is this. He was surrounded by people who were chirping at him all the time, right? They'd be saying, uh, hey, Saul, you know, David, you know, he's the one who's going to be the next king. Yeah, yeah, king, I think he's going to try to take your throne away from him. I wouldn't trust David if I were you. David's after more than, and next thing you know, Saul is convinced that David is after his throne. At that point, Saul says, we need to kill David. Now, instead of taking a look at this from a godly point of view, Saul looked at this from a worldly point of view. He, instead of taking a look at David and saying, hey, well, maybe David is the better king. Maybe I should step aside and let the better man take over. But instead, he heard all the people talking, and he came to the conclusion, David is to blame. and He must be killed. So there was this long, drawn-out search for David to kill him. The Lord always let him know where Saul was going to be, and so he would escape, and he would escape, and escape, and escape. And if you were a godly person, you may want to step back and come before the Lord and say, Lord, why is it that I cannot put my hands on David? Are you letting him escape? If you were a godly person, you would ask, uh, Lord, let me step away from my emotions and just show me. Show me the fact that God had released his anointing and his blessing and his authority away from Saul and put it on David. And maybe if he was a godly king, he would have realized there's a better person. But he did not think like a godly person. He thought like a person of the culture. He thought out of his humanity. And of course, we never want to give up power, so he went out and continued to try to fight and to, to, to somehow find David and put him to death. Until one time, uh, David and his army were hiding, cowering in the back of this cave. And then all of a sudden, King Saul comes into the cave, and they thought they were doomed. They thought that uh, King Saul was leading his army in there, and they were trapped, and they're all going to be slaughtered. And they thought the end was done, but it turns out uh, King Saul just came in there to answer a call of nature. He came in there to just get his business done. So here was the king, all alone, in a cave, with David's army. And now David's army started whispering to him, and they said, Now's your chance, David. Now's your chance. This is what God always said. This is now your chance. He had, God has delivered your enemy into your hands. So he comes out from the rock, pulls out his knife, and he comes up to David, or comes up to Saul, and he shoves his knife right into his cloak and cuts off just a little bit and walks away. When the king was done doing what he needed to do, he left the cave, and David ran after him. He said, Saul, my king, my lord, why are you tracking me down? Why are you trying to kill me? I would never harm you. Don't you see? I had the chance to kill you, and all I did was cut off a little piece of your cloak. I would never kill the Lord's anointed. He buried his face in the ground and he said, I am and always have been your servant. That is a godly response to ungodly acts. We all need to rethink the way we respond when people come after us. Maybe not to kill us. Maybe to talk badly about us. Maybe to try to push us aside. How do you react? How do you react when uh, people are bad to you? 
Hmm? Oftentimes our reactions are human reactions. Sometimes our reactions, uh, we respond uh, by being defensive. And so if someone is doing something that is clearly unfair, unnice, uh, they're, they're being wrong to us, we often react defensively. In other words, what we try to do is a human reaction. If someone says something about us, we say, oh yeah, 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 well how about you? How about you? You do this and this and this and this, right? Now I know that sounds like junior high or elementary school behavior, doesn't it? But adults do it too all the time. And what that means is that you are adults, but sometimes we act like children and not really think through what is the godly response. Instead, we turn it around and say, well, yeah, well, what about you? And how about this? But of course, we're Minnesotans and we don't do that very well, do we? No, no, no. Uh, you know, if, if Ross is talking bad about me, I don't say, oh, yeah, Ross, you think about that? Well, what about you, huh? We're Minnesotans. We don't do that. No, of course not. Ross just happened to be handy, by the way. He's not been talking about me. Just think I better. Just think I better. <laughs> if Matt was in the front row, I would have said the same thing about Matt. But, <laughs> yeah. but in his case, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but we don't do that in Minnesota because we're Minnesota nice. We never confront the person outright. Oh, no. What we would do is that uh, if Ross is saying this over to me, I come over to Matt and say, can you believe what Ross is saying about me? I can't even believe it. I think he's really the one. Yeah, he says this, but I think this. And next thing you know, what you try to do is you try to get more people on your side. That's the Minnesota passive aggressive, I mean, um, um, uh, Minnesota nice uh, way to do that. But honestly, it happens all the time, doesn't it? Have you ever been in the midst of uh, two people who are fighting and someone's trying to get you on their side? Anyone? I'm the only one, right, good. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Me, Drew, and Jackson are the only ones who have been in the midst of that kind of struggle. You see, it is so easy, isn't it? And the thing is, when someone you know and like comes up to you and says, I can't believe this person did this to me, and that's really terrible, isn't it? They, let me tell you the worst of it. It's like this, 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 and this. And you say, well, I know, and I like this person, so I want to believe this person. Uh, that you hear one side of the issue, and now all of a sudden you think, well, they must be right, and the other person must be awful, right? Anyone hear one side of a story? That's acting defensively. That's acting junior high. That's acting out of our humanity and culture and not of godly wisdom, amen? There's the difference. It's so easy to do that. It's so easy to get caught in that trap so when you know that that is like a human reaction, we also need to take some pity on King Saul, okay? If not pity, we need to understand why uh, a king would do that which he did. And it looks like this in uh, 1 Samuel 18. It says, uh, as they danced and they sang, Saul slayed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. It says Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They credit David for 10,000, he thought, but me with only 1,000. What more can he get but the kingdom? So in his mind, that's a defensive reaction. The crowd doesn't like him, so, well, he's worse off than anyone ever believed. He's after the throne. A reaction that's based out of emotion. Instead of letting your emotion away, step back and say, Lord, what truly is the situation here? And how can I react in a godly way? 
another way we react, sometimes we react defensively, but you know, sometimes uh, our response can come out of revenge. Hmm. Oftentimes when we want revenge, we, we would say stuff or think stuff or talk about other people, like to say, oh, one of these days he's going to get what's coming to him. Oh boy, I wish I could really take care of him. I wish he would get what he deserves. Anyone ever say or think that kind of thing? Yeah, look, at the hands are really popping up now, right? Right? Uh, now believe me, that's happened to me too. I mean, there are times when I, I remember when I was in high school, there was this bully who, man, I thought about, oh. Uh, I'd like to get him in a dark alley and really take him, and I'd show him what's for. Yeah, i get even with him. But, you know, that's not the Minnesota thing to do either. We don't get even. In Minnesota, we say, I don't get even. I get, I get more. So there, I'll really teach him a lesson. I don't get even with him. Yeah, I go beyond that. I'd like to string him up. Maybe. Maybe. But let me caution you, okay? My guess is all the fantasies we spin about getting even with somebody, right? Hopefully we're not going to do anything about it, are we? Are we? Or are we? I think I've told this story before, but it's worth telling. Uh, this friend of mine, way back many years ago, we worked together. And this guy took his girlfriend, right? That's the way he put it. This guy stole my girlfriend from me. Isn't that just awful? And of course, in my mind, I'm thinking, uh, yeah, I think the girl made a decision. Uh, I don't think anyone can actually steal someone away. I think there's probably something going on with your relationship. But I'm sitting here thinking, hmm, yeah, huh, hmm, yeah, hmm. Yeah, well, I showed him. I really got him. Uh, I left the bar, and I went out there, and I had my knife, and he slit the tires, all four tires. And he says, and, you know, each one of those tires cost 200 bucks. Well, back then that was a lot of money, right? As if today 200 bucks a tire is not a lot of money, okay? And yeah, I showed him and no one can ever prove it. Oh. Did you get your girlfriend back after that? Was your girlfriend so impressed? Wow, my ex-boyfriend slit some t someone's tires. He's the man for me. Well, no, of course not. Someone's laughing. I hope that's nervous, not nervous laughter, like, ah, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we all learn to say revenge just isn't the way. Now, we've all thought about it. In fact, as you know, I'm a pastor of a church, right? And you, you would have no idea all the things that are said about me. In fact, uh, one time uh, there was an SPR, I'm sorry, I don't want to speak code, a staff parish relations committee meeting, and uh, uh, they all gathered around in a big circle. Well, Pastor, you know, we have some things we need to talk about. I can't believe that you would actually do this. Do what? And they told the whole story of what they heard of how, what a dastardly human being I am. And I thought, I did remember meeting this person once, and to the best of my recollection, we talked for small talk for about 38 seconds. And all of this? In fact, I even said to them, don't you know me? Don't you know my heart? Does what you're describing even mildly reflect my character? Do you really think I would be that nasty? And, of course, eventually they say, well, probably not. Let's hear your side of the story. I told you my side of the story. It's this much. But that's so easy to fall into, isn't it? You hear one side of the story and your decision is made. And you want to get even. There were times in my ministry where I wanted to come up and I wanted to, to, to just stew about it for so long and come out and prepare the next day and to come in on Sunday morning and really suck it to them. But that doesn't do any good, does it? Of course not. Revenge, by the way, very rarely hurts the person you're trying to take revenge upon. Think about that. The guy who got his tires slit, right? He had insurance, and they said, well, what happened to my tires? 
Insurance took care of it. He went on not even knowing that someone's out there hating him. But this guy told the story over and over and over. You see, when we are focused on revenge, that of us. It hurts us more than it hurts anyone else. And that's not the godly response, is it? And this uh, story is, continues about, uh, about King Saul. He came to the sheep pens along the way, and there was a cave there. And Saul went in to relieve himself. This is an interesting translation. I've heard worse. And then David and his men were in the back of the cave. And the men said, this is the day that the Lord spoke to you of when he said that I will, I will uh, give your enemies into your hands and you can deal with him as you wish. Do you see what God is doing here? God is saying, if you're going to be a king, you need to be after my own heart. And if you are after my heart, you will do the right thing. So I will deliver your enemy into your hands. And it sounded almost like a test didn't it? I will deliver him into your hands and do what you want. Take out your knife. Are you going to slit his throat or cut his cloak? David crept up unnoticed and cut off the corner of Saul's robes. Even when we want revenge, that is our human reaction not the reaction of a godly heart. Probably the most important thing I need to say here today is this. A godly response comes from a spirit of reconciliation. Reconciliation literally means to bring back together again. In fact, uh, one of the translations in my Bible uses this definition. Isn't this great? Reconciliation is to bring back together again for wholeness. Doesn't that sound like what God wants in our lives? Doesn't that sound what God would want in each and every part of our lives to be brought back to wholeness again? Now, you see, David, he made a godly reaction. He went and cut off his, just a little sliver of his cloak, and this is the way it turned out. And he said to Saul, why do you listen to the men around you saying David is trying to harm you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some of my men urged me to kill you, but I spared you, king. I said, I will not lay hands on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. And then he got down on his knees, down on his face, and basically said, okay, king, here I am. If you want to kill me, go ahead and kill me. But this is the key point here, folks. When you do not react defensively, when you say, I will not act out of revenge, when you try to act out of a spirit of reconciliation, God works in really cool ways. You see, if you, contribute, if you continue to perpetuate that kind of evil and angry response, they will get even more angry in return. But when you respond out of grace and love, it has a tendency to melt the heart of the person you think is your enemy. I mean, after all, it's pretty hard to stay angry at someone who just says, my Lord, I will never hurt you. I surrender to you entirely. This is the way Saul responded. He said, when David finished saying this, Saul asked, is that your voice, David, my son? Can, can you almost see how he was in this, this haze of anger and, and, and revenge where he couldn't see, hear, or think clearly? But when David repented and when David came to Saul, it's like that anger haze washed away. Is that you, my son, David? And then he wept aloud. Then he says this, 
You are more righteous than I. You have treated me well. I've treated you badly. In the next few verses, it talks about how they were brought back together again. The real question is, how are you going to react when things go badly in your life? Are you going to react as the world would react? Or are you going to react out of a godly heart? In just a few minutes, I'm going to ask us all to pray together. And I hope that you would just simply open up your mind and open up your heart to allow the Lord to examine your heart and encourage you to live a life seeking after God's own heart. Let's pray together. Most gracious and holy Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you, O Lord. And we pray, O Lord, that you would wash over us with the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray, O Lord, that you would continually guide us and help us to steer away from worldly reactions and instead be filled with a love of God so that we would be people who would be seeking hearts after your own. O Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We worship you and we adore you in Jesus' glorious name. Amen.